Well, the first man that treated, I recall, uh, his way as soon as I got under the uh, under the pier, uh, there was a, a sergeant. I remember his name, Sergeant Tucker. I, I forget where he's from, but I knew him. But uh, he was wounded pretty severely, and uh, I did treat him. He was wounded in his abdomen. He was his abdomen was opened up. His stomach, stomach was open. How did you treat him? Well, first of all, I did the best I could with uh, getting him back into his, his insides, back into his, back into where they were supposed to be, and then, then I gave him morphine, and uh, he had some other scratches and uh, bleeding and a few other places, but they were not severe. This stomach was his problem. But anyway, he was, everybody was all over the place. They, they, they called us, I don't know why they did. They, Call most of us Doc. I said we were That's what they called, and they were called a Doc everywhere. So anyway, the sergeant the sergeant was conscious. He knew what he was, what, what was going on, and he told me he said I'm all right now. He said I'll be fine. You go ahead to somebody else, and I did. Went on to others. Do you know you're needed all over the place, but you can only do one at a time. So you do bandages. You do stop. Put on tourniquets if sometimes to stop bleeding, and to do what you could. It's, all, it's just a just a matter of rough first aid, I guess, doing it. You could look at the severity of the wound usually and tell whether he was dead or not as a rule. Now this one sergeant, he was not he was near death, but he, he was still conscious. And I was, so others were, and some of them had their arms off, some of them, their legs were off, and all kind of stuff like that. And you know pretty well those were going to die right quick. They, weren't going, they were in the process of dying when you'd see them. But, uh, Would you treat them? Not, not some of them, they were real severe. There was no wait. There was no point. In it. Maybe give them morphine, something like that. No treatment. There was no treatment we could do. Thank you for watching. Remember World War II. Please do not forget to subscribe and like this video. It really helps our channel grow. When I finally got to the beach, because I was a little, little later, because I made it over there, I had a pier. That, it was just a, uh, only 10, 50, 10, 15 feet wide, I guess, uh, jutted out into the ocean. And uh, it was just a flat, it was some up on, elevated up on post, you know, you could, you could walk up under it. And of course, I made it to that uh, pl place, and there was, of course, already a lot of wounded Marines under there when I got there. And, uh, but you could see it. You could see the very it was close enough to the beach. You could see the beach. You could see the activity going on. Of course, when we got to the beach, there was Marines everywhere in the water. Dead. And that lasted. They didn't. They didn't uh, clean it up for the time. Well, they just started when I was leaving. I think the last day. And, that's another thing as far you without I just read an article where they they got they began to identify some of those bodies and I was shipping them back yeah. for burial here in the states in the last year or two because of DNA they, they over there but anyway they uh, I don't see how they could do it. what they did most of the time of the of the dead they gathered their uh, uh, their, their dog tags and they, they got, but what the, were they were Marines, animals, Japanese, what they had a big tractor, and they dug big trenches, and put them, everybody in those in those trenches and covered them up. How they how they found them and identified them is a mystery to me. I don't see how they could do it. Uh, they, they were hot weather, of course. They, uh, the Marines were bloated and uh, very. Not very bad, but it was, there was a lot of Marines in that particular because you could hardly. Well, the the, the water was constantly moving them in and out, in and out, and uh, they were bloated and swelled. And uh, anyway, it was it was you could walk on if you if you were to think about that for I don't know, a long long ways you could walk and never walk on the land you'd walk on bodies. Any time you were. You were out there. You were, the machine guns was going constantly. They had plenty of ammunition. They had plenty of machine guns. They had uh, mortars, uh, small 
svara ja, challenge or whatever you want to call it uh, offshore because uh, as quickly as they possibly could the Marines knocked out all the heavy stuff so I mean, uh, tried to get out all of it but then after that all was over the, the second day or so you had uh, uh, people in the, in the coconut trees because coconut trees were almost destroyed but there was enough of them they could climb up in there and they, they would be uh, uh, they were fire, they were set up their fire from the from the trees, treetops. Of course, they didn't care about getting killed. They didn't didn't worry about getting. Japanese were very. Those they they committed suicide or like Harry Carey, whatever you want to call it. Tinian was not very. Uh, there must wasn't a lot of resistance. There was some, but uh, the we have snipers. But of course, the snipers were always around, always around, and this we were uh, several of us were crawled up to a place, it was a bankman in front of us, and uh, we told this guy, I said, don't stand up now, there's, there's snipers over there. Well, uh, he was standing almost close to you, I guess, where you're sitting, and uh, he stood up anyway. The sniper got him through the head, right through the head. He dropped dead, right there and there. And you told him not to stand? We told him. It was not on me, it was two or three others around, told him, don't stand up, no, don't stand up. He stood up anyway, did last. I forget where that was. We had a, it was on Toronto, it must have been Saipan, I guess. We had a, a aid station set up for surgery. And I worked in that one night because uh, this Marine had to have his leg taken off. And uh, it was a tent, they had set up a tent. And uh, I was, felt, felt my duty to helped the doctor that night. And uh, anyway, we did all kind of crazy things. So I told him, he said, before you go in, take a chew of tobacco. I said, chew of tobacco? Uh, he said, I'm telling you, take a chew of So I did. I took it. Anyway, I got in there, and the doctor cut his leg and all that, and took a saw and started sawing the bone. and. Uh, I had to go outside and spit the tobacco out, so I, uh, that was an episode, that was my only episode of, of that closer, I helped with the, with the injured, injured Marine, but uh, anyway, that was, that was kind of an odd incident, but anyway, I didn't, I didn't want to chew tobacco after that. You, you feel an lot, awful lot of responsibility, and you wonder if you're doing, doing the best you can, if you, doing, if you think you're doing each person, uh, any help that you can, if you give it all the help you can, if you're doing your best, and that is stressful because, but it didn't bother me that much. I was because I knew I was doing everything I could. There was anything else that was left undone. It was left up to doctors and and, and, the, and the and the injured as to whether they recovered or not. In this segment. Mr. Tool talks about his close calls on Saipan. We were on Saipan. Was it lasted a good long time. We had uh, uh, and it was mountainous. Of course, the Ato Tarawa was completely flat, but Saipan was uh, was uh, was a mountain island. And, uh, of course, Garapan, the city of Garapan on Saipan was a pretty good, pretty large city. But we went in there and we invaded pretty pretty fast. We moved inland pretty fast. There were a lot of Japanese, there was a lot of natives on Saipan also. But uh, we went through the city of uh, Garapan, and Garapan was leveled almost. There was a few buildings left, uh, partially standing. There was one was well, one was a bank, and I remember all the money that was there, Japanese money. And then we went. There was another building on on. Uh, uh, so I, oh, in, Garapan, in Garapan was a storage building for for groceries and food for the for the soldiers of the Japanese soldiers, and I remember one thing was uh, uh, crab meat, cans and cans of crab meat in that building, all sealed. And we knew it was good, so I lived on crab meat for several days because of the, uh, going through that. But the the, the city the city of Garapan was a pretty large city, but it was completely destroyed. But we went on inland, of course, and went on. We had also on, on Saipan, we had natives. A lot of the natives were uh, 
afraid of the Americans, and uh, they committed the natives. A lot of the natives committed suicide just like the Japanese did. The uh, Marines drove them up on a high cliff, and they jumped off the cliff with their children and families and killed themselves. So many. I watched a lot of them. I was going to say, did you see that? Oh yes, I saw a lot of it. They were we tried to tried to the Marines tried to warn them not to do it, but they did it anyway. They they were afraid of the Marines. So, okay. And of course, the Marines had loudspeakers. They were trying to warn them not to do it. But so many of them, I watched them do it. There was a big high cliff, and the rocks down below. And they just, they were their children. A lot of how yeah. would they go about jumping off? Like they just go up there. And you see them up there. All the thing. They, they watch while some of them jump, 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 jump over and over. You know, the Marines couldn't stop them. Would they throw their kids? Oh yeah, not the smaller ones they would. Other kids would jump if they on their own. And the Japanese were so determined until they, uh, they the last uh, uh, wave they sent through, they were, they were out of ammunition and some of them only had spears or sharp sticks or something, they were still attacking. And they, out in front of us, they began to pile up and the Japanese were climbing over one another, all of the dead, to get across and they didn't have enough ammunition, but the Marines were killed, they killed all of them, they came in. In fact, there was a major battle right near, and as we were going through, uh, a, lot of, a lot of Japanese were there dead. And of course, I got a, everybody got a souvenir. I got a, uh, a bayonet off of one of the, one of the Japanese, and I kept it. And I, in fact, I, my grandson still has it. And I also got some uh, uh, picture, uh, Albums, picture albums, off of fair. The fact of it is, I had a one or two. It was a, a big album, pretty good sized album, and I brought it back with me. And uh, years ago, there was a lady, a Japanese lady, that ran a, a bookstore and uh, greeting cards and all here. And uh, she was from Japan, and we, I was hoping she could help me find. I returned those those pictures, but she said that without more information or names, it'd be almost an impossibility. But I was hoping I could get them returned to the family. But I had a lot of those, a lot of that stuff. I uh, I had one that was on. He was on Saipan. Saipan was a much longer battle, and uh, and they, the Japanese even had tanks on Saipan. And we were this guy and I would crawling oh, because the tanks were coming, we could hear them pretty close by, and we were crawling up uh, through an area, and uh, the Japanese were also in the area with, with, gun, with, fight, with rifles, and they shot this guy in the shoulder, hit him in the shoulder, he's right beside me. And uh, anyway, to make, that's the little story, but, um, oh, I can't think of his name, uh, anyway. I, I had to, he wasn't serious, he was just a, a, a shot through the, through the shoulder part. And uh, he wasn't, I got some, got him a bandage and all that stuff. And I had to get him evacuated back where he get a, a boat and get back to the ship. But anyway, uh, he was from the state of Washington. I'm trying to think of his name, I can't, but anyway, uh, after the war, he wrote to me, he wrote to me for several years. Uh, told me I was getting along and all that. And, uh, but that was a sort of a little different um, thing that had happened to. In this segment, Mr. Toole talks about his intense combat experiences on Tarawa. Well, you can see flashes, of course. You can see smoke, and uh, you can hear the noise. But they, we lay out there uh, offshore for I guess a day and a half or more. Well, no, we went out on ship. They, 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 we won't ship for quite a while and watch them bombard the island. But then uh, we we got in the uh, Higgins boat, so the landing craft. Uh, then we there was so much opposition, they wouldn't they wouldn't land them because they we circled all night long, and uh, because there was an abandoned uh, ship out in the harbor that for, for I don't know what where they were from, but it was a rusty, big, rusty ship. But uh, the Japanese set up machine gun nest in that ship. As the Marines got off these uh, landing craft, they were, they were killing them as they got off. The Higgins boats was lined up, dropping the, drop, dropping the Marines off, but uh, so many of them, they dropped them off in water that was over, over their heads. Some of them had heavy packs, 
And of course, they drowned. But even I, the way I, they dropped me off, I was group, was about waist deep in water. But my medical pack and all that did not get wet. It was high enough up on my back to get wet. And I don't remember, I don't know why I was carrying a 45 at that time or, or, or uh, Carby, and I don't remember, but uh, either one I remember that didn't get wet. But I didn't need it anyway because you, you didn't have time to to fight. You had you had used to busy with uh, helping helping Marines. They it told you to move just as fast as you could. Of course, you couldn't move very fast in the water because it was too deep. You could only you know just wade best you could move. But the bullets was going you know all over the water, all spraying the water everywhere. So right when they dropped the ramp, you guys were taking on fire. Right. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. You could see all the fire from the beach. You know, of course, you were like I say, a lot of good ways, but you could see the smoke and the, uh, the people on the beach doing the fire. But of course, uh, the, the Marines were, were firing back, and soon, it, pretty soon, it, 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 they got they eliminated all the ones that were the Japanese that were along the beach fire, and they all went into the bunkers or into their in a, you know, fortified areas, and of course there wasn't any more up there. So then the Marines had to go and get them out of those out of those areas. But it was uh, it was coconut logs and all that's where they built up, and uh, they were they were safe in there. You get I got well I went right up to the some of them. Yeah, we went because they went Japanese were inside. They were there was Marines all around. They couldn't fire. They couldn't come out because they didn't got killed. So the only way they could get them out of there was with the flamethrowers. So you know, I was right there. I was all over the island, pretty much. Uh, they had, usually the Japanese would have two or three openings because those, those, so those, 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 uh, those things, and uh, they could run in and out of either one. They were all open. But the Japanese, I mean, the Americans, would, would, would there be somebody standing at the opening of, of one end and somebody at the flamethrower the other end, so whenever they came out, if they were still alive, they were shot. One of the saddest things that I, that there was a lot, but I guess maybe I saw this Japanese that was captured. He was by himself. His arm, he was standing, but his arm was almost, his skin was holding it. Nobody was helping him. I'm sure eventually he got help. And I thought he was alone, his people were dead. And he was had a major injury, major injuries. And I, to me, maybe I'm wrong, but that stuck in my mind as bad as anything. He was uh, he, he probably probably lived, I'm sure. But uh, I saw Marines, of course, die in much worse shape. But to me, he was, although he was the enemy, he didn't have the he didn't have the help that our, our, our wounded had. And I think that was. That was pretty sad to me. In this segment, Mr. Tool talks about his faith in God. I used to have nightmares. Even after I married, I had nightmares for a while. I wake up, and uh, my wife would have to tell me that I was, you know, calm me down and all that. That went on for about a year, I guess, or something like that. Wasn't too bad. Loud noises, did they bother you? They did. They did that. Uh, Still does to that. I think a lot of people talk about Christmas time with the fireworks and all that. I don't remember ever seeing a wounded cry. I did see there was some of the Marines that got such uh, their minds got. I saw them completely have a breakdown. A few of them on Saipan. I saw that they went through so much. They gone through so much. They just they sit and just cry. That's all they could do. They had to evacuate them usually. They'd be shell shocked. I guess that might be what you call it. It was surprising that the ones that I saw so badly wounded were not uh, any more emotional than they were. They were most of them were pretty calm. They may be tense, maybe complaining about pain, or maybe hollering or something. But most of the time they were pretty calm. It's amazing that uh, I guess they train themselves to, to combat that know it's coming or know it might be coming. The chances are it's coming, especially with the, with the, those places that we were. They, they knew there was a good chance that we were going to be, most of the people knew that their chance of survival was very slim to nothing. So you're saying that the men who were killed, the one, you know, 
if they were severely wounded first before they died, they took it very calmly. Most of them did. I didn't see anybody that was really, that they were severely injured. I didn't see anybody except that they were showing they were in pain, but as far as being emotional, no, I never did see it. I carried a, a what they call a carbine, which was a small, a small rifle, a lightweight, or either a 45, 45 pistol. I don't know of any corpsman that actually used their guns, but everybody had a gun. What were the toughest kind of injuries to treat? Amputa I mean, whether it was amputations, I guess, or legs blown off, or arms blown off, or something like that, or the stomach too was another one. You couldn't do much for them. You know, if you're asking me, was I afraid? Yes, I was afraid. Somebody said here, well, I heard somebody say, well, I never was afraid. I don't know anybody that wasn't afraid. Everybody else was, they were afraid, they were scared. I thought my chashes were pretty small in her wedding because it was too, too much. Uh, I th yeah, I did think it was a possibility. That's the reason I th when, it, when I was through with the third one. You didn't go to Okinawa? I didn't want to go to Okinawa. I said if I did, I, God had kept me safe for three. The fourth one I figured it wouldn't make, so I said I didn't want to go.